Okay, I think we're going to start now. It's really a very great honour for me to be um, introducing this talk by Terence Tao and starting off the first full working day of the Congress. Um, although we've heard quite a bit about uh, Terry yesterday, I still find myself with rather a lot to say, but I'll try and say it as quickly as I can so as not to steal time from the talk itself. Um, Tao is, I think, not so much a very great mathematician as a mathematical phenomenon. He's really quite an extraordinary person. Um, he was born in 1975. Uh, a mere 16 years later, found him graduating from Flinders University of South Australia. And uh, that was one year after he had published his first book, which was um, a book about um, Olympiad problems in Australia and how to solve them. And you might like to know that that book has just been reissued by Oxford University Press. And if you hurry, you might be able to get a copy here at this Congress. Um, I first met him at IHES in France. And um, I was introduced to him and he said, maybe we could talk math at some point. So I sort of said, OK, maybe. And uh, he came and visited me in my office. And I mentioned to him that there was some, he said he was interested in cacao type problems. And I said, oh, well, there's this paper of Bourguin that I'd really like to understand, but it's quite tough. He proceeded to give me the most incredible exposition in which he explained what all the key ideas were. The underlying ideas were really quite simple, and all the intuition behind it was right there. Um, so I realized I was dealing with a rather extraordinary person. At that stage, he was, uh, I think, 22 or perhaps 23. Anyway, still extremely young. He's now published well over 100 papers, and these are pretty serious papers. A lot of them are extremely long. It's, uh, um, I don't know how he does it. Uh, and how he also finds time to publish more books, at least two more. Um, one I think you'll find on the CUP stall, and another one I think is in the pipeline, but will come out fairly soon. And there may be others as well, I think. Um, and to close what I say, I want to just illustrate uh, what an extraordinary and modern mathematician he is by telling a statistic. Um, he's got an incredible web page. And I did a little experiment with Google. I typed in the word Terence, just Terence, to see where he would appear, and he came fifth. And perhaps more extraordinarily, I then typed in Tau, and the first thing it said was, perhaps you'd like to refine your search. Well, I didn't refine my search, and Terence Tau's homepage comes 11th, which is pretty good considering the competition. Um, Right, well, that's enough about uh, Terence because he's got to uh, come and give his talk. There are two things about the talk that I just have to announce. One is that this is the, it, uh, he's a new Fields medalist, but he was also already down to give a plenary lecture. So this is sort of doubled up as, a, as the special Fields medalist lecture for um, Tau. So there won't be another one. That's a more of a thing to say for people who aren't here, I suppose. But, uh, and the other thing is that he's changed his title slightly, and it's now called The Dichotomy Between Structure and randomness. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is uh, it's really quite overwhelming, actually. But, uh, I'm very, of course, glad to be here. Um, I did change my title of the talk quite a lot, but it's actually. Uh, I will, I will still talk about long ethnic progressions in the primes, um, even though there's almost no intersection in the title, except for the word the. Um, the um, so rather than talk, talk about the result itself or its proof, which I will, um, I do want to focus more on a sort of a theme that, uh, that is in the proof, this dichotomy between structure and randomness, because this theme, is this something, is this, uh, is this something I can lower the sound? Um, maybe just stay away from the microphone. Um, this theme actually uh, has come up in many other areas of, of analysis and, in fact, many, almost anything I've, I've worked in, I've seen this dichotomy. And uh, different people call it different things, but I think it's, it's something that needs to uh, uh, be popularized a bit more. So this is what I'll be talking about. Okay, so... Um, so, 
Uh, so the first part of the talk is going to be very general. I'll try to talk about sort of many fields of mathematics at once, and then I'll talk about the primes at the end. Um, so um, there are many. There's this basic problem that comes up all over the place in um, analysis, PD, um, applied mathematics, and combinatorics, which is that you want to study, uh, you want to prove something for uh, um, all objects in the class, you know, and you're just given an arbitrary object, and you have to say something about it. But the problem is that it lives in a very high dimensional space, or maybe an infinite dimensional space, and that makes it, uh, um, and so it has no structure. Um, so an example is that you have a set of, uh, a subset of, of n points, a, a graph on n vertices, a function on n values, or maybe a dynamical system with n degrees of freedom, um, and n could be maybe infinite, and you still want to say something. Um, but the problem is that there's, there's just uh, too many of these, of these sets, uh, or too many of these objects, and most of them don't have uh, any useful structure. So, um, so in, uh, in applied mathematics, it's often called the curse of dimensionality, that you, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to process large data or search through large data. Um, in PDE, uh, it comes up because things that, um, you lose compactness, um, that um, um, you have uh, boundless sequences don't always converge, uh, don't have converging subsequences, uh, controlling things on small, on small balls doesn't imply control on big balls, um, control in one norm doesn't, control, doesn't imply control in another norm, and, uh, yeah, and objects just have, uh, just, uh, have, have no, have, are not low complexity. Okay, but in all these situations, there's, there's, it's often this amazing phenomenon that um, sort of gets around this. So even though you have a big, high-dimensional space where things live, the uh, um, is, is somebody give this echo. It's a bit um, that um, the space of, of, of sort of interesting objects in your space uh, is actually often a lot smaller. Uh, in fact, often very low-dimensional or compact, or it's something that you can actually just um, ex um, classify somehow. Uh, and this comes up all over the place. Um, in PDE, um, it comes up especially in parabolic theory. The um, heat flow methods are, are very uh, good at taking generic objects and smoothing them out and replacing them with, with much more structured objects. Uh, for example, the, the heat flow operators give rise to the Little Paley theory, which is, uh, which is fundamental in harmonic analysis. And of course, the most dramatic example of how parabolic theory uh, now is, is the, uh, the Ricci flow method of Hamilton and Perelman. Uh, that takes an arbitrary metric and deforms it to an extremely structured one. Um, this concentration compactness of Leon's, uh, that's another PD technique that uh, uh, allows you to uh, get around the fact that that, um, um, that boundaries are not compact in infinite dimensions, but if you choose the right topology and you choose the right notion of compactness, you can still uh, extract subsequences and ex extract out sort of by sort of keeping the, uh, the important part of, of your solution and throwing away all the rubbish. Um, and then there are all these wonderful structure theorems in combinatorics, um, which uh, take an arbitrary big object, like an arbitrary graph, and, 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 and give it structure. So there's the, the Zermatty regularity lemma that gives graph structure. There's the uh, first and structure theorem that gives some um, dynamical system structure. And there are all these additive structure theorems that give... Uh, um, the um, um, subsets of an additive group structure. Um, and last but not least, there is uh, signal processing. So back to applied mathematics. Um, so they've known about this phenomenon for ages, that uh, if you have a big noisy signal, you should, uh, which is t takes a huge amount of space, you can compress it, you can clean it up, you can uh, replace it by something uh, much lower complexity, but still does the same sort of thing. So. So what do all these things have in common? I mean, how, why can you take a big dimensional uh, space and somehow compress it to a uh, lower dimensional one? So it's, it's re I think all these things are really coming from a, a dichotomy between what I call structure and randomness. Oh, so I have this color convention in, in these slides. Anything green is going to be structured. Anything blue is going to be random. Okay. Um, so among, among all objects, there's sort of these two extreme types of objects that, uh, that, that you want to study. So um, on the one hand, there's objects with a lot of structure, very algebraic or very rigid objects. Um, what structured means is, is hard to define, usually. But here's just some examples of what it could mean. So um, all functions take functions that are periodic or smooth or low frequency. Out of all graphs, take low complexity graphs, graphs that can be described 
say, as uh, complete graphs or complete bipartite graphs, um, then because it's sort of compact, all the orbits um, uh, of functions are, are, are compact and so forth. In PDE, the uh, analog of structured waves are solitons. Um, and then at the other extreme, the objects which are not just unstructured, but are sort of orthogonal to structure. They, they, have, um, they behave randomly, pseudo-random objects. So take functions that, rather than being periodic and very predictable, they're, they're very random, um, very high frequency, very rough. Um, if you have a graph, you have a, some sort of uh, pseudo-random graph, um, a dynamical system which is now mixing. So instead of uh, functions returning to themselves, they, return, they, they become orthogonal to themselves. Uh, and in PDE, you get um, radiation, um, ways that's, that's, that decay to infinity rather than sort of uh, stay coherent. So um, yeah, defining these rigorously is hard. Um, but let me just give you uh, not definitions, but uh, word associations, just to sort of uh, give you an idea of what, uh, what I mean here. So I've got this sort of side-by-side uh, uh, -side comparison. So, um, yeah, so, well, it's, it's, none of these words sort of have any precise meaning, um, but um, sort of all the words in, on, in green are associated to being structured, and all the words in, in blue are associated to being pseudo-random. Maybe I'll just, uh, I'll, and maybe I'll just explain the, the last two uh, rows there. So not only do you have this sort of um, contrast between these, these two concepts, the techniques used to, to understand them are, are very different. So uh, structured objects are ones for which uh, you want to use algebraic methods. You have exact equalities, identities, and you want to use, and they have lots of geometric structure. Uh, in contrast, uh, when things are very random, you want to use methods of probability or analysis. You tend to have estimates rather than identities. That's rather less than sign rather than the yeah, equal sign there. Okay, but uh, this is, this is uh, just a very vague tableau there. So why, why is this uh, dichotomy, uh, why, why are these two notions so, uh, so useful? Um, well, it stems from, from this one, the first fact, which is that uh, of these two extreme cases of uh, objects, structured objects and random objects, uh, the random objects, the random part usually doesn't do anything if you're doing, if you're doing some sort of averaging. They, uh, random things tend to, tend to average themselves out. When, um, and so, um, yeah, so if you're doing any sort of statistics, uh, some sort of averaging, some sort of integrals, uh, any sort of correlations, something like that, um, if your object is a big random component, often that random component is negligible. And there's lots of, of ways to, uh, uh, there's lots of places where that gets exhibited. Um, in ergodic theory, for example, there's um, uh, these von Neumann ergodic theorems, or ergodic theorems in general, that say that if your system or function is, has some sort of sufficiently mixing, then when you average it, it becomes either zero or constant or something very, very simple. And there are lots of theorems of this type. Um, in PDE, there's a, you have perturbation theory that if you, if you modify a, an equation by a solution by, by adding some noise, if the noise is sufficiently dispersed, not actually concentrating at any given point, but if some space-time integral is very small or something, then it also doesn't do very much to your, to your equation. Um, in combinatorics, uh, you have things like counting lemmas. If you have, a, if you have a, um, a graph which is some sort of regular or random subgraph of a, of, a, uh, of a bigger graph, then the statistics of that graph, like how many triangles or how many other things are in that graph, is a, will be basically a proportional subset of, of, the, of the statistics of the big graph. And so the pseudo-random part is sort of neg is, uh, you can often throw away. Uh, and these results are also very, uh, usually very easy to prove. Uh, they're usually harmonic analysis methods. In fact, a lot of these things you can just get by just by the cauchy schwartz inequality. Uh, not so much the perturbation theory. There you need some slightly more sophisticated harmonic analysis, but these are fairly simple results generally. So because of this, um, you would like to, to know, given any object, is it random, is it structured? Because, if it's, uh, because we know we can throw away the random part and just sort of uh, and, uh, just focus on the structured part. And in, in general, you sort of encounter this typical conjecture that if you have a very natural object, what that means, and there's some obvious structure to it, but then after a while you don't see any more structure, then people start conjecturing that after that it's random. So uh, this comes up, this type of conjecture comes up all over the place, but it's usually incredibly hard to prove these can sort of conjecture. To actually establish that something deterministic behaves randomly is uh, 
I think it's a problem that we basically don't know how to, how to, how to solve yet. And just to give you an example here, um, here are sort of three types of conjectures that lead to problems that we have no idea how to solve. Um, so, for example, the, the primes are not random because, for example, they're almost all odd. Okay, that's, that's definite structure. The, 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 they, they behave non-randomly mod 2, mod 3, mod 5. But after these local obstructions, we expect after, uh, after all that to uh, be taken into account, there should be no more structure. The things behave randomly. And there are ways to make that, make, make that conjecture um, formal. Um, if you're doing additive number theory, it becomes the highly through a prime tuples conjecture. If you're doing multiplicative number theory, it becomes the Riemann hypothesis. And we can't prove either. Um, for PDE, if you have a very highly nonlinear PDE, we expect um, that even if you have deterministic data, that somehow these, the, these, the solution should, should become very um, random over time, except for the fact that it has to obey conservation laws, it has to obey some obvious structures, but after that, it should somehow diffuse um, over um, um, all configurations which are consistent with these laws. So, um, for example, the, the problem of justifying statistical mechanics is uh, um, rigorously is, is in this class. That's completely uh, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, even more difficult is the Navier-Stokes global regularity problem, which has this feature somehow that, that, you, ex that you must somehow ex exploit um, uh, some sort of random diffusion process. But uh, we don't know how to actually make that work. Um, and then in complexity theory, uh, you want to somehow create algorithms that are deterministic, but, um, but still behave randomly. Um, and, you know, for example, these constructions of expander graphs and so forth is, 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 is an example of these sort of things. Um, and presumably, if you want to solve the problem P equals PPP, P equals BPP, uh, you have to somehow quantify, understand this, this phenomenon very well. And possibly, okay, I'm a little bit hesitant to put that one on the screen. It's just that I put two other clay price problems up there. I'm going to put a third, a third one. Um, it may possibly be in related to P equals not equal to MP, but that's, that's, that's a much more speculative thing. Well, Avi will talk about this after me. So. Anyway, so uh, it would be fantastic if we had some sort of oracle or method that would take any object like the primes and, say, and test it with a series. Is it random or structured? That would really be, be fantastic. Um, we can't do that, usually. Um, but it's amazing what you can do by for much weaker principles that aren't always true or aren't always known, but when they do are known, they become very, very useful. So just to, to illustrate this. So my four principles here. Um, so again, I'm keeping it very general. I, I will specialize to number theory and so forth in, in the second half of my talk. So the first basic thing is, is that while we can't tell what things are structured and what things are random, I can tell you that if you're not random, then um, it's, not, it's not that you're structured, but you have a, you have a structured bit. You, you, ha you, have, you have some correlation you have, or component which is structured. So, um, or conversely, if you are not structured, you must have some randomness inside you. Um, so, for example, um, uh, in the theory of uniform distribution, if, if you have a set or function that is not regular, not uniformly distributed, you can often uh, blame that distribution, if you wish, uh, on a large Fourier coefficient. Some, some Fourier coefficient is being large. Um, or maybe some, some generalization of a Fourier coefficient. So, uh, for example, uh, Vowell's theorem on uniform distributions of this type. Uh, the hardy little circle method is sort of of this type. And I think Ben will talk about this in his, his talk, Ben Green. Um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. The, the work of Roth and then later Tim Gowers on Zamredi's theorem is also based on, on this, this sort of idea, uh, although much more generalized than what I said here. Um, similarly, in, in ergodic theory, dynamical systems, if, you, if, if, uh, if your system is refusing to, to mix, if you have some function which is not uh, uh, becoming orthogonal to itself when you shift it, it has to be because of the presence of an eigenfunction, which is a very structured object. Um, so this is a theorem, uh, it, I think, uh, of Koopman and von Neumann. Um, and in PDE, if your solution is, is not radiating to dispersing to zero, it's because either there's a, some sort of bound state that's trapping things, uh, or maybe that, or there's some, co some, some coefficient in some basis, like a wavelet basis, is large. So, um, okay, so um, these dichotomies come up all over the place, and, this, and they, they're usually proven by some sort of Fourier analysis type method, or spectral theory, which is, which is very similar. Um, although Fourier analysis has become a very, you know, the, um, in many cases, you can't actually use classical Fourier analysis. You have to, you have to use something a bit fancier. But, uh, this is a whole other to topic of the talk. 
Okay, once you have a dichotomy, you can then often iterate it, and then you get something really useful. You get a structure theorem that uh, often you can take any object, and a generic object is usually not structured or and it's not random, but you can often split it into a structured bit and a random bit. Uh, and that's really useful because um, uh, because st st structured objects are amenable to one type of analysis. Like you can, you can attack them using algebra and geometry, and random things you can att attack using probability and analysis. And so once you have a structured theorem, you can use all four techniques to, to, uh, to understand a general object, um, which wouldn't have been accessible to just a subset of these techniques. And this, this is really uh, um, a key to a lot, a lot of things. Uh, for example, to uh, my result of Bennett with the primes. Um, so um, just, again, there are many examples of such structure theorems. Let me just sort of describe three classes of these things. So uh, perhaps the most familiar one is, is, is the spectral theorem, that, uh, uh, that if it's an operator, let's say self joint on a Hilbert space, then uh, you, can, you can decompose the spectrum into an, uh, the discrete spectrum, which is uh, almost periodic. Um, we iterate it with the, um, if you, um, if the, uh, um, the orbits are, are, of any given function is compact. And, to, and a mixing bit, the part which is continuous or absolutely continuous. Um, there are various flavors of how you can do this decomposition. Um, there's a little period decomposition in homework analysis. You can decompose any, any object into a smooth part or low frequency part, which is sort of uh, coming from the coarse scales and a high frequency part coming from the fine scales. Uh, you can also think of this as a Martingale decomposition, the same sort of thing. Uh, and then there's, of course, the famous uh, Zimmeretti regularity lemma that, uh, that a graph no matter how big and how complex, uh, you can, well, uh, uh, decompose is sort of a funny thing. It, it, um, you have to think of the graph as a function, a, a zero one value function, and split it uh, in order to think of it as a decomposition. But a graph is, is, is really is sort of decomposed into, into a low complexity partition of vertices with some um, density weights between these, these partition classes. And then you have some, some regular graphs that are between these, these, these classes. And the partitions are driving the structure, and, the, and then everything else is just sort of random. And as long as you're doing statistics, it doesn't really matter. OK, so uh, these are, uh, so these structure theorems are often, you just take the dichotomy and run with it and see what you get. Um, and uh, so you have a general function. If it's structured, you're done. If it's not, you've got a, some, sorry, if it's pseudo-random, you're done. If it's not pseudo-random, then it's got a structured bit, so you take that out and you make it a bit smaller. And now you look again: is it is, is, is your remainder pseudo-random? If it is, you're done. Otherwise, there's another structured bit. You take it out and you keep iterating that, and and then you you um, you uh, you get this. If you're doing PDE, you may have to solve some sort of parabolic equation in order to get some sort of this, this kind of decomposition. You could, I guess, you could argue that the geometrization conjecture is sort of the one of these an ultimate version of one of these structure theorems, but. Uh, um, okay, and they're very useful because once you have a superposition and you know that pseudo-random things are not very important, you only have to look at, at, at the structured part. But what do you do with the structured part? Well, there are two other principles that are extremely useful too. So uh, once you have structure, once you have a bit of, once you have a bit of structure, uh, it's often this amazing phenomenon that you can somehow bootstrap that and get a lot of structure. Uh, so uh, I call this rigidity. I don't have a good name for this. That somehow. Um, um, if something is, is almost uh, completely structured, then it's, you can repair it or clean it up and actually make it completely structured. Um, so I, I first encountered this in combinatorics that, uh, um, yeah, for example, if it's, um, you have a set which is almost closed on an addition, so that uh, you have some set where if you take sums, you're, you're, you're back in the set, say, 1% of the time. Uh, so you sort of 1% additively closed. Then you can actually get, uh, that means that you're actually close to a set which is much, much more additively closed than, than and you thought initially. It might be a group or a convex set or uh, a progression or some sort of combination of, of, of these things. Okay, so uh, there's a famous uh, inverse thing of Freiman to this extent, and there's like, a lot of generalizations. Um, in PDE, this, uh, the, the corresponding thing is the, uh, the pally smell, pally smell phenomenon, that, uh, that if you're trying to minimize some variational problem, like minimizing energy, and, you have, and you're getting closer and closer to the minimum, um, then even though your whole space is not compact, um, um, if, you, if, if you have this a sequence of, of almost minimizers, uh, they tend to get closer and closer to actual minimizers. So some of the actual minimizers are, um, well, it's, uh, and in fact, this, this, is, this is the way you often construct the minimizers of, of, a, of, a, of a function you, uh, by extracting this compactness. And in fact, uh, Professor Hamilton just mentioned uh, compactness theorem of this type uh, yesterday. 
So um, you, you often have to um, define the notion of compactness properly um, in order to get this phenomenon. But when you do, you, you tend to have stop convergence. And then in, um, in uh, computer science, you have uh, this whole property testing phenomenon that uh, if, you want, if you have a humongous graph or function, like, you know, like the internet, and you want to uh, verify a property on it, uh, you, can't, you don't want to test the whole graph, but uh, if you can just sort of take a random piece and, and verify the property that you, you want there locally, um, that usually means that your property is sort of almost uh, sort of approximately satisfied. Um, then you can often, um, is, then it's not globally satisfied. You can often sort of um, uh, modify it just a little bit, you know, add or subtract some edges, and then make it uh, perfectly satisfied. And this is how you, you can do property testing. So uh, yeah, these, are, these are often these types of results are, are actually really quite deep. Usually, uh, you have to use structure theorems a lot. For example, a lot of property testing results use the Zermatt irregularity lemma. Um, okay. And then, all right. So if you're approximately structured, you can make it perfectly structured. And then once you're perfectly structured, you can classify it. Um, so once you're perfectly structured, uh, you can often describe these objects in a very explicit but I guess more importantly, in a very algebraic and geometric fashion, so that you can start using the tools of, of algebra and geometry. Um, so some, some very simple examples, if you have a, a finitely generated Boolean group, or um, you can physically have a basis, and now you, 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 have a classification, you, have a, you have a standard classification theorem of these things. Or, um, or linear transformations, you create a basis, and you have some nice matrix. Maybe you can, maybe you can diagonalize it. Could I form? It can also uh, you know, take a, a nice normal form. Um, those are simple examples than the more advanced ones. Um, in PDE, uh, one of the most famous ones is, is that uh, the solitons and multisolitons can be described in many, many ways by, by some very nice um, algebraic geometry um, uh, methods using uh, um, like J-Holm of curves, for example. Right? There's, 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 there's lots of really, really pretty and very structured um, um, formulas that exactly describe what these solutions are doing. Um, and there's, there's an example which um, I think uh, Brian and Crow talk about uh, uh, today, this afternoon, that uh, in, in ergodic theory, uh, when you're studying multiple currents, the, uh, the perfectly structured component of, of, of any dynamical system is, is what's called the minimal characteristic factor, and those have been completely cla classified now via uh, nil, nil systems, which, are, which arise from important groups, new important Lie groups, finite dimensional new important Lie groups. So, um, okay, I won't talk about that though. So um, yeah, those are, are often also very difficult, uh, and they're not. The, the other three principles are often very analytic. This, these ones are, are much more algebraic in structure. Okay, so th th those are very very general things. Let's actually have a concrete example. So um, the example which sort of illustrates a lot of these of these principles at once, I think, and almost the uh, uh, the quintess quintessential example is this amazing theorem of Zermatt. Um, so Zermatt's theorem is easy to state. It says that if you take any subset of the integers of positive density, so you take, say, 1% of the integers. So I guess I didn't define upper density. Uh, maybe, well, it's, it's easy to define, but, but um, basically it means that if you take, the, say, the numbers from minus n to n, uh, for some large n, and you, you look at the, the proportion of, 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 of those numbers that are in A, that it's, 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 uh, this number is bounded from below um, infinitely often. So, yeah, so take 1% of the integers. Um, and take any 1%. Uh, no matter what you do, you, uh, you inevitably are forced to have a set which contains uh, arbitrarily long algebraic progressions. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really quite an amazing result because you get to choose the set. You know, I mean, um, given any pattern, for example, um, if you want to, uh, to eliminate all, say, pairs of, of adjacent numbers, n, n plus 1. It's, it's very easy to choose a set which avoids all adjacent numbers, like the even numbers. Um, but you cannot, uh, as long as your set is large, uh, that's, that's the only thing you know about, about your set A, it's large. You, no matter how you try to move it around, you cannot, you cannot destroy progressions. You cannot remove completely progressions from the set. And that's, that's really quite an amazing phenomenon. And, and this theorem is very deep. Uh, I mean, one, one, in, one example, of, one proof that's deep is by, by seeing how many people have proved it, uh, the people who proved it. <laughs> uh, so, of course, Andre proved it, for, Andre Zemreddy proved it first in 75 uh, with a combinatorial method. Um, Thurstenberg proved it again using a, um, an ergodic theory method, which was very influential in ergodic theory. Uh, and then Tim Gowers proved, used a Fourier analytic argument. 
Um, and then there have been actually some subsequent proofs since um, by uh, Rodo and Skogan and also another one by Gauss and so forth. Um, so the, the, the reason why this, this theorem is, is hard, I mean, I, I do not believe there's a short proof of this theorem. Um, it's because your, your set A is arbitrary. It could, on, it could be very structured, um, a structure that's, say, um, a periodic set or, be very, or very random, um, and actually more, um, more generally it's going to be some sort of combination of both. And structured sets have progressions and random sets have progressions, but they have, progress they have progressions for different reasons. And so the, the, you, you cannot hope for a one-size-fits-all proof. You must split your set into the two components first before you can, do any, before you can prove this theorem. So what does structured mean here? Um, structured is actually not easy to define, um, and that's actually one of the hardest things in proving. Well, actually, it depends on the proof. I, I mentioned three proofs, and each of the three proofs is easy in, in, in one area and difficult in another. Um, and, um, but the difficulty moves around. Um, actually, what I did with, with, with Ben Green is that we took all those three proofs. Actually, there was a fourth one. We took four proofs, and we took the easy bit out of each one. And they were easy in different areas. We were able to patch them together. But, it's another story. Um, anyway, so what a structured means. So um, a good example of a structured set is a periodic set. Say the, the multiple is 100. That's a set of density um, 1%. Or more generally, um, a quasi-periodic set. So a set of all numbers n such that um, root 2 times n is very close to an integer. That's a set which is actually very similar to a periodic set, but it's not quite periodic. It's what's called quasi-periodic. Um, and then a more interesting example is these things called quadratic quasi-periodic sets, where you take numbers n such that, say, root 2 times n squared, or more generally a polynomial with irrational coefficients, uh, is close to an integer. Um, okay, so, so th these are sets that are described very algebraically. Um, and, uh, and the thing about these sets is that, is that if you know that a lot of elements of progression lie in the set, then you can often tell that the next element is going to lie in the set as well. For example, if, uh, if you take um, a progression on f3, and the first two are multiples of 100, you know the third one also is a multiple of 100. Um, and the same type of thing is almost true for the quasi-periodic set. I, I said that if the, first two numbers, if, if the first two numbers in the progression lie in the set, then in fact, uh, about half the time, the, uh, the, thir the third element will also lie in the set. Uh, that's not true for the quadratic uh, uh, set, but if you take a progression of length 4, and the first three um, um, the, the, the first three elements are in the set, then with a very large probability, like 1 over 8, uh, the, the fourth guy is also going to lie in, in, in the set as well. It's basically because a, a quadratic polynomial uh, can be described by its values in three points. You can then interpolate and get the whole thing. Okay, so, um, all right, so because of that correlation, okay, well, that once you have a, a, a few elements, a, a few um, points in your set, of a progression in your set, you get the rest sort of for free, uh, that's that's really the cause of why these sets have progressions. Like periodic sets so clearly have long ethnic progressions, and it's because of this correlation. And the correlation is caused by algebraic structure, such as periodicity. And these, sort of, and these other sets have some sort of generalized notion of periodicity. And in fact, those are what's captured by these important groups, which I will not talk about. But I think Brian and I will talk about it uh, this afternoon. So that's structure. Uh, on, the other, on the other extreme, there's pseudorandomness. Um, so what does pseudorandomness mean? Um, so the, uh, the, the basic example is, a, is actually randomness. You, you take each number and you roll the 100-sided dice for, for die, die, dice for each uh, die, for each, um, each number. And if it comes up one, then you put it in your set independently. And that's a random set. Uh, more generally, you can take sets that are deterministic but behave randomly because certain correlations are, uh, correlations are small. Um, for example, um, you take a set and you compare it with shifts, and you, uh, if you're random, you expect the, the density of the intersection to be roughly the product of the densities of, 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 of a sum. This is a, uh, that by itself is not very, uh, it's not very good. This is a two-point correlation. Often you need uh, uh, higher point correlations to be under control, but th that's the type of thing that, 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 that you want. Um, and if you have enough of the pseudorandomness, then you can start, uh, then it's random enough that you can use probability theory. And basically, um, if you're pseudorandom, then if the first few elements of, a, of your set, of, of a progression on your set, then the next guy, um, the event of the next guy's in the set as well is basically independent of, 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 the, of the events that, uh, that the previous guys were in the set. And so um, the probability of that a, a long progression is in your set is basically, should naively be just the product of the, the probability that each individual element is in the set. 
in your positive density, there's a, there's a positive probability of S. So that's sort of why you expect um, um, lots of progressions in, in the random case. That is a little bit too naive, but that, that's sort of uh, roughly um, what, uh, what you expect here. So, so in, in this case, progressions are caused not by structure, but in fact by the absence of structure, by independence, by correlation, di uh, discorrelation. So completely different cause of progressions. And then, um, and then we have hybrid sets, which are combinations of both. Um, so this is where most sets fall in. Okay, they're neither completely random, completely structured, but they happen to be uh, bits of both. So uh, for example, you can take a pseudo-random subset of a structured set. So you can take the even numbers, that's a structured set, periodic, uh, and then within the even numbers, take a random subset of that. Take 2% of the, of the even numbers at random. So you roll the 50-sided dice, um, die. Um, and, um, and you just uh, you randomly sample the even numbers. So that's neither random nor structured, but it's, it's a bit of both. Um, a bit more generally, you can take a pseudo-random subset, of, not of a, of a single structured set, but of a structured partition. You partition the integers into structured pieces, and for each piece, you choose a, a random subset. So you might take, uh, say, 3% um, of the even numbers and 1% of the odd numbers at random. Um, and the thing is that if you already know that structured sets have progressions, and if you know that um, pseudo-random sets have, well, once you know the structured set for progressions, if you take a random subset of the structured set, um, that random set will contain a proportional number of progressions to the big set. Um, so that's a, sort of a more general, um, that's the sort of negligibility uh, type property I mentioned earlier. Um, and so once you know structured sets have progressions, then anything, any random subset of those will also have progressions as well. And so any, that basically tells you that these hybrid sets have progressions. So in this case, the progressions come from a combination of algebraic structure, which, uh, which gives you the initial candidate progressions, and then the discorrelation, which tells you that when you refine to your set, you still keep some progressions. Okay, and then the key thing that makes things work is a structure theorem. And depending on the proof that you use, Zemretti's proof, Furstenberg's proof, Gower's proof, the, the structure theorem is different, but it's always present. Um, and Basically, uh, the theorem is that uh, if you take a, dent, a big dense set, uh, you can always find a large bit, which um, uh, which is not comp it's globally pseudo-random, but it's a pseudo-random subset of a structured set. Um, so, uh, for example, in um, in the proofs of Roth and the, the Tim Gowers, uh, uh, the uh, the statement is that if you take a, a big dense set, you can find a, a progression, a structured set inside that big set where your set looks random. Okay. Um, and once you have that, you're done. Because, I, because what I'm saying is that every big set contains one of these hybrid sets, and the hybrid sets contain progressions, and this is why your big set contains progressions. Um, and these sort of structure theorems, in turn, follow from, um, from dichotomies, uh, and um, dichotomies tend to look something like this, that if, if your set uh, um, is not random, doesn't behave randomly, it's like some correlation is big, um, then the reason for that is because it is correlating with something structured. Uh, what that means depends on the proof. Uh, it's a typical thing is that uh, there's some sub-progression um, of your whole space where your density is, 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 is bigger than, than, than normal. Um, okay. There are other very different looking formulations of the dichotomy, but there's always some sort of dichotomy underlying the proof. Okay, so that was the uh, 10 minute version of Zemmerdi's theorem. I mean, the, the, each proof takes you know, at least a whole hour to talk about, but I won't do that here. Okay, so now I can talk about uh, my own theorem with, uh, with Ben Green, uh, which is uh, we talk about not, not dense subsets of the integers, but um, much uh, much sparser set, uh, but a specific sparse set, uh, the primes. Uh, there are conjectures about what uh, how sparse you need to be to contain progressions. There's this uh, beautiful conjecture called the Erdős-Turán conjecture that says that if you have a, a set of say positive integers whose uh, sum of reciprocals diverges, then then you contain arbitrary long progressions. Um, so that's much stronger than Zemmerdi's theorem, and it would also imply our theorem here. Uh, we have no idea how to prove that. Uh, it's a fantastic problem, but that's, an, again, an, an, another talk. Um, well, we don't, we don't have the results, so it's not even a talk. But um, anyway, but we, we can do the primes. Um, so as I said before, um, we, this result uh, is not surprising um, based on the conjectures we have on the primes. Um, we, 
we do believe that the primates behave randomly after, well, except for local obstructions, like um, the fact that they're almost all odd and so forth. But apart from these sort of obvious structures, we behave that we expect these primates to behave randomly, and there's a precise conjecture for that, the highly literal prime tuples conjecture. Uh, this is the conjecture, for example, with, that uh, leads us to believe why the twin prime conjecture is true, why Goldbach's conjecture is true, at least asymptotically. Um, it's, it's why it's, this, this, this sort of heuristic sort of underlies of quite a few of, of the uh, of our beliefs in, in, in what's true about the primes. Um, so, um, okay, and if you're random enough, you should be able to contain progressions without any difficulty. Um, but the thing is, we can't verify that. We don't know. Right? We still do not know uh, how random the primes are. Uh, we do know one thing about the prime, one thing result with direction, which is already useful. Um, we do know that the primes behave uh, Fourier pseudorandomly, which is a uh, uh, a weaker notion of pseudorandomness. It means essentially that the Fourier coefficients of the primes are small, except when they're obviously not small. And they, they can be obviously not small coming from these local obstructions. Um, these, uh, um, uh, like, for example, if they're all odd, then the Fourier coefficient at one half is going to be very huge. Um, okay, so there are these sort of major arcs where things are, things are big. But, but uh, if those are not present, if you're in the minor arcs, then um, we do have a pseudorandomness. And this, this is a uh, uh, basically, um, a um, method of Vinogradov, and this is enough to do to get some of this conjecture. You can uh, you can get uh, progressions of length three in the primes from that, and this is really done by Van der Kolpen in 1927. Um, but unfortunately, it's now well understood that Fourier pseudorandomness is actually far weaker than sort of uh, well, it's it's it, it, well, there's there's a whole hierarchy of pseudo of pseudorandomness apparently, and Fourier pseudorandomness is actually very low on the list. And um, it's, it's, it's good enough to control progression of length three, but even for progression of length four, um, it's, it's not enough. There are examples of Fourier pseudorandom sets which do not have the right number of progression of length four. In fact, this quadratic quasi periodic set uh, I mentioned earlier is an example. So this, this is not enough. Uh, although, well, if you go to Ben Green's talk in uh, uh, Friday or something, he'll, he'll talk about uh, how you can sort of boost this to, uh, uh, to higher length progressions. Okay. I mean, the, the, the circle method does actually extend, but it's not trivial. Okay, so uh, the primes have density zero. Um, right, as you go further and further, fewer and fewer numbers of prime, uh, but in density, not in absolute number. Um, so you can't apply Zermody's theorem directly. Um, but what we were able to exploit was the fact that even though the primes uh, are sparse in the integers, um, they are dense in a different sense. They are, they are dense with respect to another set, uh, the set of almost primes. So, um, this, um, well, almost primes is, is a bit hard to define, but, uh, well, the way we actually use it is uh, the almost primes are not actually a set. They're, they're a weight function, a measure. But, that's a, um, but you should think of almost primes as, as numbers with very few prime factors, like numbers of only, say, 10 prime factors um, at most. Um, and those type of numbers, it was known for a long time that, um, that those guys we can count. Um, because, uh, yeah, in, fact, in fact, they do behave like we expect um, the primes to behave, that they are pseudorandom after accounting for the obvious reasons why they're not pseudorandom. Uh, and that is, and in fact, a large part of sieve theory is sort of aimed towards uh, making that statement precise. Um, Basically, the, um, the, the primes can be, can be extracted, the primes up to some number n can be extracted by the sieve, by sieves such as the sieve Eratosthenes. That is not the sieve we actually use in practice, but it's a very simple example. If you want to find the primes up to n, you, you throw away mobs of 2, mobs of 3, mobs of 5, up to root n. And then after that, what's left are, are the primes. Uh, but the problem is that the, you're, you're throwing away, you're doing too many steps. And um, it's sort of easy to see what happens when you throw away multiples of two, multiples of three. But once you get to multiples of root n, you're, you're, you're doing many, many uh, um, uh, little changes. You're doing many, many uh, little, um, you're moving many, many um, small sets from your big, uh, to create your primes. And it's hard to keep control. But if you stop the sieve earlier, say at n to the one, not a square root of n, but n to the 100th, um, then you can still keep control on what you have left. Uh, well, not for that sieve. You have to smooth out the sieve and, and do some tricks. But essentially, you can stop the sieve a lot earlier and still understand exactly what, what your set is doing. But then you don't get primes anymore. You get almost primes. If you stop the sieve too early, you only get primes with, which are um, co-primed to everything less than n to the 1 of 100. And so it has at most 100 prime factors. OK, anyway, um, so the primes are not, uh, OK, so 
the primes are not dense in the integers, but they, are, they turn out to be dense in the almost primes. They're a subset of the almost primes, and they are large. So if, if, the, if you define almost primes to be, to be numbers of at most 100 prime factors, the primes have density roughly about 1%, uh, up to a factor of E or something, um, in the almost primes. OK, so um, the way we use that is that so we managed to prove uh, an extension of Zermody's theorem, which I'll call a relative Zermody theorem, that um, so not just any dense subset of integers, but any dense subset of a pseudorandom set of integers. Um, so rather than take the whole integers, take a representative subset of the integers, in this case, the almost primes. So, so this is sort of your I don't know, a focus group, if you wish. I, the, 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 um, they sort of uh, evenly represent the, the whole integers. Then any, it's, we still have this, this transference principle that, that any theorem that you can prove for the integers should somehow have some counterpart for uh, this representative sample of the integers. So this is the counterpart of, of Zermeri theorem, that um, if you take a pseudorandom set of integers, then any subset of that should still have, have arbitrary long progressions. And this is why we can get progressions in the primes, um, because the primes are dense subsets of the almost primes, and the almost primes uh, are pseudorandom, and so we just apply this theorem, and the primes have progressions, have, have long progressions. So in, in fact, you can see we, we almost use nothing about the primes. I could even take um, a dense subset of the primes. I could take 1% of the primes at random, and I, st I still know there are long I think, progressions there. So in, in some sense, uh, so this, our theorem is really a big cheat. Uh, I mean, the, the, so the reason why, one of the reasons why uh, this, uh, this result was, was desired, progressions in the primes, was that the hope was that you would learn something about the primes by doing so. Uh, but in fact, we don't actually uh, tell you very much about the primes, thing, anything new about the primes, other than they have long progressions. Um, because we, uh, in particular, we, uh, we have, this doesn't settle the question whether primes are pseudorandom. Um, and we just completely avoid that question. Uh, it, instead, they just have to be a dense subset of something else that's pseudorandom. And that's enough to get what, what we, we have. We do have a, a, um, a subsequent program to actually try to get the pseudorandoms of the primes directly. And again, Ben Green will talk about that. Um, and I think I might, if I have time, I might briefly mention it too. OK, so let me just talk a little bit about how we prove this, this relative theorem. Um, so we use, we use the Zermody theorem as uh, one of our ingredients. Um, and then we combine it with two other facts. So um, yeah, so again, it's, it's based on structure theorem. That uh, if you take a dense subset of a random set, um, it, could, it's, it, it need not be random itself. Um, and it, in fact, it probably isn't. Well, actually, no. Actually, Generically, it is, okay, but, uh, but it, it might not be. Um, but nevertheless, um, anything which is, if you take any dense subset of a pseudorandom set, it turns out that it's, um, it's got a large bit which, which is um, pseudorandom. Um, well, except that it may not be pseudorandom of, uh, well, it's not a pseudorandom subset of the whole set, it's a pseudorandom subset of a dense set. A, okay, this theorem uh, is not tautological. In fact, it's, 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 it's rather non trivial. So dense subsets of pseudorandom sets are pseudorandom subsets of dense, have pseudorandom subsets of dense sets. Um, OK. I, I, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how soon it's proven shortly. But, um, but anyway, if you believe that theorem, that, that for example, the, 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 with the primes, well, I'll tell you that the primes contain a large subset, which, um, which are not pseudorandom, but they're, they're a pseudorandom subset of something dense. And, um, and then we have a negligibility result that says that uh, uh, so it's, if you have a pseudorandom subset of a, of, a big, of a big set, even if that set is very sparse, um, it will still contain a proportional number of ethnic progressions um, subject to some technical assumptions. But, um, okay. but basically, yeah, pseudorandom subset should contain a, a, a fraction, uh, the expected fraction of, of, of uh, um, progressions of a big set. Once you have that, you're done. Once you have those two results, you're done because um, Zermody's theorem tells you that dense sets already contain lots and lots of progressions. And then um, this negligibility result tells you that any pseudorandom subset of a dense set contains lots of progressions. And then I just told you that, uh, that things like the primes contain pseudorandom subsets of dense sets, and so they contain progressions too. Um, so these two things are the, uh, are the two really new ingredients in, in our argument, but, uh, but they fall into the framework that I was, I was discussing, discussing earlier. Um, yeah, so um, the negligibility is, is not so difficult. It's, uh, you just apply Cauchy-Schwartz a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, if you apply Cauchy-Schwartz and you, 
the, the main difficulty in, in approving that is to set up the right notation. Um, but, uh, okay, that is, is basically uh, Lotz and Sakashi Schwartz. Um, oh, and defining what pseudorandom means, that's, a, that's the other difficulty. But fortunately, Tim Gao has actually sold that one for us. So, um, okay, so the, but the, uh, the harder part was actually the structure theorem. Um, and the structure theorem ultimately comes from this, this dichotomy that um, if you take a dense subset of a, of a pseudorandom set, such as the primes, which are living inside the almost primes, um, if that set is itself not pseudorandom, then it turns out that that actually correlates with, with something structured. Um, but what's the, 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 the key thing is that even though your set is, is sparse, the structure set that you correlate with it is dense. Uh, and this is, this is somehow what, 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 what drives the whole thing. So if the primes were not pseudorandom, it's because they are um, correlating, they are biased with something very, very structured, such as a progression, uh, um, such as one, one of the structured sets I mentioned earlier, like a, like a, a periodic set or quasi-periodic set. Um, those are the sort of things that, that, that uh, are, um, 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 those, it's, it's the dense structured sets that, that are blocking pseudorandomness. Um, and, and that's really, uh, okay, and the, it's, it's, it, that dense is key because that, that gives you, the, uh, in the structure theorem, that, uh, the, 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 the word dense in the conclusion, which is, and then that's what lets you apply Zemredi's theorem for dense sets to get you those things for sparse sets. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the proof because uh, the actual details are lengthy. Um, let's skip that. Oopsie. So um, I'll just tell you what Ben and I are working on nowadays. Um, so that was two years ago. So, this, um, so um, the theorems I just mentioned um, tell you um, that sets of progressions, that, that, that dense sets have lots of progressions, that primes have lots of progressions. Um, but they don't say exactly how many they are. Well, they say they're infinite, but, okay, but uh, they're infinitely many. But um, more quantitatively, if you ask how many progressions of a certain length, k, are there among, say, the prime numbers up to some level n, um, as n gets very, very big, right, what is the asymptotic uh, count of these things? Okay, so that's a more precise question. We know it goes to infinity, uh, and in fact, the, 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 uh, our theorem actually gives a lower bound, but, it's, it's not, it, but the lower bound is not sharp. It's definitely not sharp. Um, so um, the next question is, is, is to ask for the precise, precise asymptotic. Uh, and here, you, um, here you, you really can't finesse things anymore. So in, in, the, in the previous theorem, we took the primes and we said, well, maybe it's random, maybe it's structured, we don't know. But in either case, we can find progressions. But in, depending on what case you're in, you will find a different number of progressions. And if you actually want the exact count of how many progressions are in the primes, you have to know how random the primes are. Um, and so that's sort of the next focus. Um, yeah, I think I just said that. Okay, and, and here is where you have to start using the, um, uh, the other facts I talked about earlier. So um, the theorem I mentioned relied mostly on the first two of my principles, of the first three of these principles, the negligibility, the dichotomy, and the structure theorem. But then we also have these rigidity and, and classification theorems. And those uh, uh, seem to give you deeper information as to, as to uh, well, more quantitative information. So uh, the prototype of this is this result of van der Korpen, that if uh, you want to count how many progressions of length three there are in the primes, less than n, uh, the answer is actually um, n squared over, so n squared is basically the, the number of progressions of length three, less than n, period. Uh, the primes of density one over log n, so you expect n squared over log cubed n, uh, progression of length three, uh, less than n, maybe one half of that. Um, but there are these local uh, irregularities. The primes are all odd, with one exception, uh, which, which uh, increases the number of, of, um, of progression in three. Because, odd, um, because if, if two numbers are odd in a progression, the next guy has to be odd as well. Um, and, so, and odd guys are more likely to be prime than even, than in even numbers. So you have, to, you have to make adjustments for, um, for mod two obstructions, mod three, mod five, mod seven. And so you can put all those, uh, you can put all those uh, correction terms together and you get this, this product here. Uh, which is some explicit number, 1.3 something. Um, I think uh, well, it'll be it'll appear in Ben's talk too. So, um, and so, um, okay. So we have this precise count plus an error that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Uh, how fast that error goes depends on things like the Riemann, Riemann hypothesis, but uh, at least we know it goes to zero even un uh, unconditionally with, with no hypotheses. Um, so the way you prove this is that you use the uh, hardy little circle method. Um, uh, combined with Vinogradov's method. Uh, no, 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 no. You, uh, uh, do, 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 do. sorry, no, no, no. You, um, the Heidelberg circle method tells you that if you want to establish this result, 
you, uh, you have to understand the Fourier coefficients of the primes, the, um, the local obstructions tell you what's going on um, on major arcs of a circle. And all you need to do is you need to show that, uh, that on minor arcs, that, um, that apart from the local obstructions, you want, you want the primes to be Fourier pseudorandom, that the Fourier coefficients of the primes are, are small. Um, and then you can throw away all the minor arcs, you can neglect them, and then you only have the local obstructions to deal with. And the local obstructions are what, what's giving you that product over there. Um, well, but in Fourier analysis, we, uh, the structured objects are completely classified. Right? The, uh, um, they are just characters, exponential sums. Okay? The, if you're not pseudorandom, if you're not Fourier pseudorandom, you, you correlate with a character. That's what it means to have a large Fourier coefficient. And so uh, all you need to do by this dichotomy between uh, pseudorandom and structure is that you have to show that the, pr the primes don't, uh, don't correlate with minor arc characters. So you have to show that the, that the primes don't correlate with, say, e to the i root 2 times, um, and times, uh, times n, uh, 2 pi i root 2 times n. Um, and there's a method for that, the Vinogrado's method, which I won't talk about here. And you do that, and, well, van der Kolbe does that, and, and you, you get this theorem, which is very nice. So it's much stronger than saying there are infinitely many progressions of that three tells you how many there are. So um, more recently, uh, Ben and I were able to, to do the same thing for other patterns of primes. Uh, we started with progression of length four. Uh, hope eventually, we, we, we look, it looks like we can get any um, linear pattern of primes uh, in which, uh, which involves sort of uh, um, except for those that only involve one parameter. Uh, they have to involve at least two independent parameters to have enough averaging to neglect uh, this, the pseudorandom part. So uh, if it wasn't for that really annoying caveat, we could, we could do things like the twin prime conjecture and the go-back conjecture and all these wonderful things. But we can't do that, but we can actually count uh, things like how many progressive lengths four there are, how many cubes of, of, or parallel pipettes there are in the primes of a certain, of a, of a certain dimension and so forth. Well, again, um, so uh, well, well, Ben will give a precise uh, uh, description of this. Um, so, uh, and that's a, this is m much more an extension of the hardy little circle method than, than our, our previous theorem. So uh, we, uh, we, we generalize the hardy little circle method. We replace Fourier sort of randomness with a more uh, sort of a higher order version of, of, of that concept, uh, Gauss uniformity. Uh, and basically, the, the key point is, is that uh, you want to show that, that uh, the primes, after eliminating these local obstructions, which you, you always have to do, uh, should be uh, Gower's uniform, which is stronger than Fourier sort of randomness, and uh, um, not, not strong enough to do things like count twins, twin primes, or sort of Goldbach, but good enough to count uh, these, like, these uh, um, multi-parameter uh, patterns, like progression of them four. Uh, progression of a multi-parameter because you have a base point and a step size. There are two parameters. Um, and so the point is that these, these um, in Fourier analysis, the structured objects are characters. In, um, uh, in this high order case, the structured objects are more complicated, but they have, they have recently been classified, uh, at least uh, for the, the, uh, in, in the case of what you need for progression in four, um, from no potent groups. Uh, they are what's called no sequences coming from a, a quotient of a no potent Lie group. And that is, a, that is a natural generalization of uh, characters, which are flows coming from, from a, uh, coming from a torus, an, ab an abelian group. And then so uh, once you have that classification, which is not trivial, uh, all you need to do is, um, is show that the, uh, the primes don't correlate with these, no with, uh, well, they, they do correlate with, with, a, with um, major arc new sequences, which I won't define what that means. But, they, but if, if, uh, if your no sequences don't come from local obstructions, you expect the primes to not correlate with those. Uh, so for example, um, uh, you expect, on that quadratically quasi-periodic set I mentioned earlier, you expect the primes to have sort of, um, the proportion of primes on that quadratically quasi-periodic set should, should, uh, should basically be the density of that set, modulus some local obstructions, which, which I don't want to talk about. And that can be done by a refined version of the Ingrados method, although that itself was also not trivial. So um, sort of each of these three dots required 50 pages of work. Uh, it's, it's three papers, uh, and that's just for progression of four. But, uh, but anyway, uh, combining them all, we can, we can now get counts of progression of length four, and soon, hopefully, uh, for, for other patterns as well. But okay, Ben will talk a lot more about that. Um, I'm done. Thank you very much.